I want to talk strictly about the death investigation today and why it's so fraudulent. From the fentanyl overdose being self-induced to the multiple moline landings, um, to the telecommunications, to the refrigerated truck at the back of Paisley Park that was all hiked up and ready to move at the memorial. We're going to talk about it all. 40 years experience listening to the music. Um, well, four and a half years now on the death investigation specifically. And if you've watched the channel before, you know that I met Prince in the afterlife during my clinical death. So today we're not going to talk about that. We're just going to talk about the fraudulent death investigation that mass media is circulating. April 21st in the rain, these are photos from the scene. You can see there's no, no love symbol statue, no flowers, no nothing, just rain. Let the rain come down. I was studying um, the parking lot and the cars and I came across this black tree and I thought it looked really strange like it had been on fire or something. I don't think that that's what wet trees look like. Now, I'm not saying there was a fire, but there was some weird things going on because the investigation talks about Fire Chief Johnson, um, but he arrived with Mark Lifton, the commander um, of the fire police. So they arrived together, but then Mark Lifton is never mentioned again. And Fire Chief Johnson is the one that they focus on, um, who should have had more experience than to pull a body out of an elevator, but he said he did it because the body felt warm and he thought it was from the radiant heat from the elevator. So I thought it was really strange that he mentioned radiant heat because we all know that Prince didn't use elevators. So if he purposely locked himself in the elevator or perhaps there was a fire outside, there would also be radiant heat in an elevator and um, Shanhassen fire could would be called. The other thing about the radiant heat is there were space heaters photographed all around Paisley Park that morning. On 4-21-2016, at about 9 o'clock, I received a telephone call from Sergeant Brunig who said Prince Rogers, with a D, Nelson, was deceased at 9 a.m. The 911 call wasn't placed until 9.43. The media reports that it's Andrew Kornfeld, the son of Howard Kornfeld, that makes the 9.43 call, but he's unable to tell the dispatcher where he is. He can only say that he was at Prince's house. According to my research, there's the east side of the building here and the west side of the building over here. If you watch the police cars go into the parking lot on those videos that are available, you'll see some of them come over here to park in the front, which is where you're used to all the media pictures and the love symbol uh, statue is at. But over here on the west side, there's actually two entrances, one there behind my head and another one right here. When Andrew refers to himself waiting in an office, um, he's waiting on the west side. And there's also the back of the complex um, here. This entrance goes around. This is a garage door here. And then around that is a tour bus. So here's that back angle. Um, it's, it's really important. See, see this teeny tiny door? Um, that door appears to lead into this area here um, where there's this semi trailer attached and right next to that is the tour bus i need to talk to you about why there was a carrier refrigerated truck this carrier refrigerated truck is affixed if you look at the top here you can see where it's attached and it's on jacks so it's jacked up apparently to the highest heights and then it's affixed at the top this is relevant um, because of Kirk's telecommunications on the 14th where he talked to Bronco Logistics Trucking Company and ordered the carrier reefer. Here is Kirk's record and it shows that he contacted Bronco Trucking Logistics and Storage several times. My brother was a trucker and these are used to keep meat and other refrigerated items cold. If your slab of meat was say five foot two and it needed to be warmed up with space heaters. Maybe that's why Fire Chief Johnson said that the body felt warm to the touch. Detective Hastings has this to say. Nelson was lying on the floor on his back with his feet near the door for the elevator. I could tell Nelson was unresponsive and not responding to any stimulation. 
I noticed that Nelson's right arm appeared to be stiff as it remained in the same position as he was moved on the floor. Just wanted to remind you the body was found allegedly and photographed on a carpet. So how did Detective Hastings notice that his arm stayed in the same position as it was moved across the floor? He had rigor mortis and they placed him on the rug. That would explain the refrigerated truck. The need for space heaters. This utility cart menaces me from the investigation photos because you could quite easily cart around a small body on a cart such as this and then put it, put it in a storage room. And if you look real closely, just look real closely. Now call me crazy, but prior to the investigation, this was affixed to the back, jacked up. During the memorial, just a day or two after, this photo was taken and the same carrier truck is on wheels ready to roll out. This is a massive cover-up of multiple investigations and they try to make it read like it's one investigation, but it's not. Um, there is the Prince residence and there is Paisley Park Studios. The other thing you need to understand is there are multiple elevators. Um, there's all the pictures of the main elevator behind the stairs. Um, that would be Paisley Park Studios when you enter through the front. There's another elevator that one of the witnesses, I believe Andrew Kornfeld, said when he was asked where the elevator was, he said on the ground floor. Now being that Paisley Park has an underground parking garage, that would be the ground floor, not the main floor. That's the main floor or the lobby. The ground floor is the one below that. At least every hospital and place I've been to, it either says B for basement or G for ground, and that means you're going to the basement. And maybe that's why Detective, excuse me, Fire Chief Johnson wanted to check for carbon monoxide levels in the basement in the underground parking garage. Why? Were they suspecting suicide because the body had rigor mortis? That's what it sounded like according to my research. Let's look at that evidence real quick. Observed prints on the floor when I entered the building of the elevator door on the ground floor on the west side. So back here where the carrier truck is, there's this little door and I believe that's the building. So during the investigation, we're shown this elevator with these pinky sort of walls. And pay close attention to this where you press the floors. This one is completely different than the other one. Not only that, um, I think this is the one we just saw um, because this one appears in the all sterling silver um, elevator that the officer went back to get the fluid that was splashed on the wall and he said it was almost all silver. Here's the best example. Um, when you look at this faceplate here, there's a pink wall on that side. When you look at this faceplate here, there's the silver wall on that side. So, you guys, it's two different elevators, you know, and they're just trying to sell it like it's one investigation. Um, now that you know that there's multiple investigations, you know, get your magazines back out, get the Beautiful Ones book back out, and start reading the things over again because you have to question everything that you're seeing not just in this investigation but in life you guys that's that's what got me to where i was in in the heavenlies um is my desire and my need to question everything my whole entire life so um again this is my sole purpose and i want to share it with you guys because i know that there's people out there that care as much as i do and there's so many lies on the internet right now that I just want you to have the truth, and it takes a while to get there. Welcome to my world. You have to wrap your mind around the fact that Paisley Park is like, you know, Disneyland. It, it, it's like a, it's a production studios. If you can make concerts, live concerts, commercials, mini movies, um, you can do anything there. So that's exactly what was being done, and that's why Kim Pratt, under investigation said that she didn't know um, who Big Julius was because the empire was so big that it was hard to get to know anybody. But yet you have the media telling you that his inner circle was Hannah and Josh and uh, the Third Eye Girl Band and all these young assistants. It's because the young female assistants were the lookalikes. Um, there was a lot of them. It, it's not just one or two, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> so I think one of the biggest um, 
things that you need to ask yourself and to listen to is the reason for the death. The media said that the death of Prince was because he was taking Vicodin, hydrocodone, and unbeknownst to him, it was laced with fentanyl. He was taking that medication because of all the years of these punishing performances and having pain in his hip, etc. It's wrong that the media investigation rests its um, case, Mark Metz, on the fact that um, no one could be found guilty in the death of, of Prince because they couldn't find out where the fentanyl came from. But I'm going to tell you where it came from. Um, and also this, you guys, this is what I mean to say. It's shown that on April 20th, while Prince was at the doctor, he had blood tests showed 0% fentanyl. Um, what it did show was hydrocodone and Percocet, but dig this. The levels that they're at are below the cutoff levels and should have never been mentioned. Um, I researched the low amounts of NCGs per whatever in the urine and, and they're at the cutoff levels. I'm pretty familiar with this stuff. And so when you're at or below the cutoff level, it's supposed to be a false test. So the reason that they mentioned that he had those things in his system was to allege that he was taking the hydrocodone laced with fentanyl, but that's not the case because if he was taking hydrocodone laced with fentanyl, his blood and his urine would have showed that on April 20th, and yet it showed nothing. So then, on the morning of April 21st, when they rush away the body, and um, the detective calls later and is told that Prince has 67.8 NCGs per liter of blood fentanyl. So those are the multiple versions of the story that are out there, but 67.8 NCGs per liter is pretty hard to ingest unless you did do it orally. And that would explain why Fire Chief Johnson said that Prince had clear liquid running out of his mouth. Now, he said, oh, it's not a foam cone, not a foam cone. A foam cone is what drug addicts will have like a, like a rabid dog, a little bit of foam coming up. And Chief Johnson said, oh, it's not a foam cone, as if to deter from the fact that it looked like an overdose or that there was something coming out of his mouth. So you tell me, are they talking about a rigored body that has clear liquid coming out of its mouth? There's several different versions going on here, and it's because it's a massive cover-up. So the major cover story that Prince needed drugs um, because he was in pain and because he had hip, hip surgery in 2010, um, that was never proven either, you guys, because if you watch my Moline videos, you'll see evidence that the Moline paperwork shows that the patient shows no prior surgery um, history. The fact that there's multiple investigations at Paisley Park is because there was multiple landings in Moline. That's why there was the need for the refrigerated carrier because the way that I read it and with my backstory afterlife knowledge, the one we know as Prince Rogers Nelson is the one who showed himself to me as the creator. And he explained to me that he didn't necessarily always have use of his body, that there was uh, possession and occult practices going on to where people would use his essence to perform as him. Um, and as crazy as that sounds, it, it, it coincides with Judith Hill's plain story. Um, most of it's a lie, but if you read it in detail, um, the fact that she says that these EMTs, first of all, she says it took forever to land. And she said that the EMTs took forever to get onto the plane. And when they did, they were moving tables around. And she said, and I quote, everybody just kind of grabbed an arm and a leg and carried him off the plane. She didn't say if the arm and leg were connected. She said, everybody just grabbed an arm and a leg and carried him off the plane. The media story is that Kirk Johnson carried him off the plane. Somebody described as a stockily built bodyguard. Kirk Johnson is five, four, five, five tops maybe. He's not a bodyguard that would really necessarily be big enough to carry Prince off the plane. But that's the story is that he stops the EMTs and he says, no, no, we'll bring him down. And he carries Prince down like a baby. So then that doesn't explain what Judith Hill said about them taking forever to land uh, because they had to circle the Moline airport for 20, 25 minutes. However, the other jet uh, 
descended 45,000 feet, I think, in 17 minutes, something to that effect, which really constituted an emergency. Again, detail for detail, you want to watch my Moline videos. The other thing about those multiple Moline landings is um, they say that the Kirk Johnson said that he left the airport at 1030, that he left Atlanta at 1030. However, the second Fox Theater concert didn't start until 1030. 